The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello to all of you. Well, it's fantastic to have so many of you online tonight. And um, it actually feels like forever that since we've done a webinar. We used to do these a lot more regularly. Um, I suppose that we've been traveling around the world a little bit too much of late. Um, it's with a great uh, amount of privilege and honor that I get to invite uh, Richard Dunn onto this webinar tonight. It is um, 3 a.m. in the morning. And so firstly, Richard, thank you very much. We really, really appreciate you sharing this knowledge. And I know your colleague, Raleen, actually just sent me a message and said uh, she tried to stay up, but uh, <laughs> she ended up falling asleep. But um, listen, we really want to thank you for being online. You know, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about who you are and, and our relationship and, and everything else. But, um, you know, Australia is somewhere that clearly intrigues people. And there are a lot of people online tonight that are really, you know, really interested in what's happening in the market there. And so welcome, and um, we look forward to hearing from uh, what, what your thoughts are on what's happening uh, in Australia. Uh, thanks, Scott, and hello to everyone. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll try and do my best to stay awake in the next uh, next hour, because it is very quiet here at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. Well, we really appreciate you being online, and um, for all the people who are online tonight for the webinar, um, it was a little bit... Uh, um, you know, we didn't give as much notice as we normally try to, but the reason being is we've got something exciting in store that we wanted to share with you, and we thought that time was of the essence. So welcome to everyone who's online. It's fantastic to have so many people online, and as always, it's a privilege to be able to share this information with you. And certainly my intention will be to keep you awake, Richard, so you don't, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> the purpose of tonight in terms of this webinar is really Australia. You know, everyone's talking about different countries, where the good markets are, where the bad markets are. And at the end of the day, markets rise and fall. There's timing is very important. You need to understand the cycles. You need to understand the nuances of markets. You need to have the right partners. All of these things are critical. But the most important thing that you need, and we always say there's only two things when it comes to property. You've got to have the right information and you've got to have the right partners. And so you know, I embarked on a journey many, many years ago, and I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but, you know, I've personally been investing in international property for over 16 years. I started at the age of 22, and I decided in the beginning of about 2008 that it was time to start looking at Australia. Now, I'd never been to, or sorry, I'd never invested in Australia. I'd been to Australia in 2003 to watch a very hopeless World Cup, um, and I'd spent over 10 weeks there and traveled all over. And I went to Australia the first time, and I really got the feeling that, that there's some very good salesmen in Australia and that they would sell you a property, you know, at Ayers Rock with a view of Sydney Harbour. And I really didn't trust people. And interestingly enough, I came across Richard, and Richard actually contacted me. Um, you know, I, we found each other through the internet. And I was really intrigued by just his knowledge, his understanding, their whole investor focus. And most importantly, all the due diligence that they did to protect the investors. And really, it fulfilled our whole objective, which was trust, transparency, and, and most importantly, not just about trying to make sales, but actually about helping people build portfolios. And that was in early 2008. We've walked uh, quite a long journey together since then. And, you know, really, you know, tonight, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's very interesting. You know, I'm going to ask Richard to tell us a little bit about himself, and I'll, I'll share some of the stories as well. But... You know, in simple terms, he's, he's, he's actively been involved in the property market for many, many years. Um, he's been one of our key partners on the ground for literally the last, uh, well, what are we now? Eight, uh, six years, six, six, nearly seven years. And he's also someone who I've got a huge amount of respect for. And that is why, you know, I've, uh, I've been actively planting seeds as to how we could work together, how we could partner together. He is, he, 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 there's a lot of good things about him. There's also some bad things about him. And um, one of them is that, um, you know, he is a Kiwi. And um, I know a lot of you when, you, when you hear the word Kiwi, you think of the mighty All Blacks. Um, unfortunately, the Kiwi is, is actually a, a little uh, runt of a pigeon, um, which is the national bird of New Zealand. But... Um, but uh, with all seriousness, um, he's, he's a great guy, a great friend of mine. We, we watched the Rugby World Cup together in 2011. And um, when France was, uh, you know, pushing hard on the line, he did say to me that if they won, um, it would be the last time he would support the All Blacks. But uh, luckily for the All Blacks, uh, they won. And um, uh, I do say with, with a bit of a smile on my face that uh, 
as, as Richard says, he's the only true Tri-Nations because he's a Kiwi, his wife's South African, and his children are Australian. So without, without further ado, Richard, I wanted to, uh, to just hand over to you and just ask you the question before we get into the detail of what's happening in the market. Tell us just a little mm -hmm. bit about yourself, your background, how a New Zealander ends up living in Australia, you know, property, your experience, uh, just to kind of set the context for those people that have not met you before. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, yes, hello, everyone. Uh, my background's been in development and construction for over 25 years. Um, I've had the pleasure uh, of working in, in a number of countries, uh, including New Zealand, Australia, uh, and the UK. Uh, my background is as a qualified builder, and I moved into the, uh, the acquisition side of things and worked for a, a number of larger Australian development companies over the years, uh, mainly in their exit strategies, uh, obviously taking a step backwards, sorry, for development and, 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 and picking the right properties and the right projects and, and also coming up with, with what people want built, what, what the market wants. Um, so I had the, the, the great experience, if you like, of, of working with some of the top developers in, in the country. Uh, and there is a method to the madness in, in Australia with, with our booms and, and all of our activity over here and, and hopefully I can share some of that with you tonight. But um, the last 10 years I've, I've spent uh, very much focused on the investment side for, for a lot of the Australian investors and for our offshore investors. So putting the product together, picking the right projects uh, and, and finding the right end-to-end -end solutions for our investors. So right. hopefully I'll be able to add to that tonight. Sorry, Scott. No, I, I just wanted to butt in there. Um, uh, two things. One is that for those of you who aren't concentrating, you can see that we will certainly be asking you different polls. We'll be keeping you engaged. Um, if, we, if you don't find our humor about uh, rugby funny, then we'll, we'll try and uh, appeal to your intellectual mind. But um, really, one of the things that, that I can say is that I've, I've had the privilege of knowing you, Richard, for, as I said, the last six or seven years. And I've got a very, very good understanding of the Australian market. And I, I really have to, to give the majority of the credit to you because on the multiple buyers trips that I've done over to Australia, um, you've taken me all over, whether it was Perth, Melbourne, Brisbane or Sydney. You've taught me about the different cities. You've taught me about the different states. You've taught me about the different segments of the market um, and how it all is cyclical. And, and, you know, a lot of the stuff that, that I knew from the UK and from South Africa was practically irrelevant in Australia. And really, I, you know, I can't, I can't overemphasize for, for people on here tonight the level of understanding that you've got. But, but there's one thing that I think that I just wanted to highlight because a lot of people don't understand it and, and don't, don't necessarily understand how important it is, is that you're not an estate agent that's decided to try and sell a couple of properties. And whether you sell them to an Aussie or whether you sell them to a South African, or to be honest, you're too desperate and there's no one in Australia to buy anything, so now you're trying to come to South Africa to make a couple of sales. Uh, it's the complete opposite. Um, you know, as you know, to repeat what you just said, for 10 years you focused purely on investors and, and, and building portfolios and, and, you know, and, and generally you guys look with, a, with at least a 10-year framework, which is what I love so much. And that's why you do so much macro research into the areas and, and the partners and the, and the type of product and everything else. But the second thing that I think is critically important here from, from your perspective is you're not coming to South Africa to try and peddle product. We went to Australia and you know it took me four trips to Australia. It took me an entire year. It took me um, dealing with a lot of useless people to finally find someone that really knew what I was talking about that, that was you know, focused on investors and that was focused on, on the long-term sustainability of investors. And I think the fact that you, know, you take all of that into account and you take into account that you actually have a building background, a property development background, and, and it really kind of ticked a lot of boxes for me. So I know I'm repeating stuff that, uh, that some people know and understand, Richard, but, but I just wanted to, to lay that out there for those that didn't understand it because it's a, it's a complete 180 degrees from you know an estate agent who's just trying to sell you some stuff. Sure, sure. No, thanks for that, Scott. Um, I think if if I could just get into it, the for everybody online, the the biggest uh, thing in Australia at the moment is affordability, uh, 
as, as you've probably heard, if, if you read and follow the global real estate market, Australia has sustained its, its house price growth and it, and it continues to do so. In fact, the forecast is for it to continue this way um, and hopefully we can sort of go into a little bit more of that in detail and I'll explain hopefully and, and give answers as to why. There is uh, two main reasons uh, for, for that sustained uh, growth, if you like. Australia does have a, a very steady population growth and it's very much centred around our major capital cities. Uh, Scott, I'm just wondering if I can maybe perhaps share some slides as I'm as I'm talking. No, do you want me to give you? Do you want me to give the? the uh, do you want me to give? I can change you to be in the presenter, and you can share some slides. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I can do that, and and then that way uh, just makes it a little bit more interesting. I've got some up to date sort of data here, um, so if you go ahead and do that. Okay, so you should be coming up now. If you just go, I'm um, show your screen. Okay. Are we going? Yep, I can see your PowerPoint. If you just uh, yeah, if you just go to slideshow, and then we got you good. Okay, great. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Perfect. Um, just for those who are not who are not entirely sure, just just to give a look, I'm sure everybody's fairly well aware of where the major cities are in in uh, in Australia. But just just a quick overview here. Um, if you can see my mouse, basically these are the capital cities that most of our population is, is centred around. Brisbane here, Sydney, Canberra the capital, Melbourne, little old Hobart there, Adelaide, Perth and Darwin and that's really the bulk of our property market and I'm sure people have been to Australia and understand that really in the middle and outside of those capital cities there's not much except sort of red volcanic rock. Uh, not really uh, development land or or places where the government wants to put infrastructure. So all of our developments focused um, mainly around those capital cities. And I've just got some of the latest stats here. And and sorry to fill your screen with with stats, but but stats do have a fair bit of relevance. And I'll come back to it a little bit. But up the top here, we 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 have houses. We have our 20-year growth um, and what's been happening for, on average in, in the major cities. And then we have our 10-year growth, the growth for last year, and then there's um, down here. Sorry, there's for our units as well. So, and we've got the same. And I, and I won't go through each one, but I just wanted to point out that there's been some sustained, consistent growth over the over the last. Really, it's a hundred years. Going back a hundred years, if you look at our historical growth, our property has doubled every seven to sort of ten years and of course since the GFC it's starting to slow down a little bit and I wanted to give people just a bit of an understanding as to why that's happening uh, and, and if you've been following the news you've probably heard of these crazy sort of house prices that are going on in places like Sydney and Melbourne at the moment and really to understand the Australian market the, the, the top end of the market is really driving these prices at the moment and, and I'll, I'll hopefully be able to explain why. So hopefully everyone's got a good view of that. Uh, this is the forecast from uh, RP Data. RP Data is one of the biggest, um, I guess, historical data gathering uh, companies that everybody goes to. And it's just interesting to see here what their predictions are uh, for the future. We all sort of thinking that the the rapid growth, even the even the surge of the last sort of eighteen months, has got to come to an end sooner or later. Uh, but realistically, from the development point of view, on the ground, seeing the demand, these figures certainly reflect the type of um, sales that that and properties that are being sold to Australians, not over, not necessarily overseas, but to a lot of Australians here as well. And we will go into the overseas investment side of things. So as you can see on the left here, we've got the predictions for the five year and eight year uh, on average for houses and for units. And you'll see generally across the board, houses and units are going to perform um, pretty much hand in hand. Um, the interesting stat, if we do keep going this way, Sydney's been sort of leading the charge um, it's hard to believe but the actual medium property value is going to hit $1 million uh, 
uh, in Sydney and by 2019, I think that's quite significant because it's up around about 850,000. Now that's not to say every property is, is that value of course because some, some very substantial um, uh, properties driving that in Sydney. Uh, and as you can see there, Melbourne is, is not going to be too far behind. So Sydney and Melbourne are historically the biggest cities where the majority of the population um, is coming to. And, and here's a little bit of the reason why. The market sort of changed, the buyers have, have tended to change um, uh, of late and it's, it's, it's the people who have been holding on to property for a long time, um, the population's aging, those people are now selling uh, and driving prices up. It's not necessarily the overseas investors, there is a lot of talk about the Chinese, that, that's, that certainly has, has a lot to do with it but it's actually the Australians that have been living uh, in their houses for, for the average of sort of seven to ten years. So if you, if you calculate that growth that, that I've just sort of shown there in, in those previous charts, you can sort of work out that, that a lot of these properties are doubling, people are selling, taking that, um, that capital gain and moving it on to a bigger and better property. So that, that's tended to, to be one of the major drivers from Australia. Now, um, I just wanted to cover off of some of the obvious questions, uh, some of the best places for opportunities uh, and really I can break it down to keep it very simple here. Um, it's areas that, it, and this is coming from, from a large development company where they would look uh, and, and this is often where you get some of the best information. So we're, we would be looking for uh, for sustained strong population growth, so we'd be looking around those capital centres. Um, we'd be looking for places that have a shortage in housing supply versus a strong demand. Obvious one there where, where there's lots of employment, lots of jobs. And number four, which is very critical, which is substantial inf infrastructure um, uh, either in place or planned, and that could be in new hospitals, new schools, uh, some of the various uh, large motorways, the, the train system, the transport systems that they're putting in. And I will get to, to break this down a little bit for you. Um, now when we talk about population projection, this is a key driver in Australia. Uh, we, every year we're looking, the way it's going at the moment, roughly about sort of 2% population growth, that's net. Um, and this is where the capital cities are sort of absorbing a lot of the population growth. So you can see the, the, the three big centres there of Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. They're all fairly um, similar in growth but a lot of, there's a lot of dynamics between the cities. So for example Brisbane has got a great climate up in Brisbane, it's very hot. For those who have been here you'll know what I mean in summer, it's, it's like your Durban weather there where you literally melt and your shoes will stick to the, um, to the tarmac at, at times. Um, but, it, but it's a very good family orientated city, uh, whereas Melbourne's more of an industrial hub, beautiful big city as well and Sydney of course is a financial capital. So every year we've got this sort of sustained, steady, um, guaranteed population growth and I've just put our current population as, as of this evening actually, so that's probably changed a little bit. Um, so hopefully everybody can understand that and just... So what are you saying, your stats, from, Richard, are you saying your stats in the first world are, are fully up to date, not like when I went to Home Affairs today and I got a blank look and I was told the system's down and there's nothing they can do? Ah, yes, absolutely. That's as of today. So it's obviously 3.30 in the morning here. So I'm probably the only sad person looking at those stats in Australia <laughs> at the moment. Um, but anyway, just to give you an idea, that's, that's a sustained growth that we have year on year. And that's a low to mid projection as well. So, and the other, obviously, which is a big one, is, is supply versus demand. There's there's been a lot of um, opinion on supply versus demand, but it's but it's also very relative to the individual market of a particular city. And what I mean by that is, there's not a huge demand for top end property, but there is a substantial demand for affordable, and that's the key word, affordable housing. So when you weigh up these markets, the biggest market in Australia is people, the mum and dad type people who have two children, um, medium, mid, sorry, mid income uh, levels that 
that can afford to buy a house that the family can live in. It's not the top end, and I just wanted to point that out. Uh, and as you can see here on this that I brought up, there is an accumulative shortfall in affordable housing that is growing year on year. And they're trying to come up with a whole variety of methods to produce more housing. And this has been, we've been talking, and I think if you remember, Scott, back in 2008, it's something that I said to you is to watch this affordable market because that's, that's where the real sort of crisis is. And people get it a bit mixed up with the top end. They'll go and visit and, Sydney. And again, or they'll go guys, and visit just, to, just a button, sorry, just to translate, you know, and I know that you know South Africa very well, Richard, and have been here a lot of times, but people kind of think affordable housing here and they think, you know, a little – a little shack uh, out in yes. the bush, you know. This this is still a four hundred thousand dollar, three hundred thousand dollar home, um, but but that by Australian standards is affordable because um, very few properties are available to to you know at, in in, a, in affordable prices for the average family. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. Sorry about that. I'll rephrase. Yeah, affordable for the average, <coughs> excuse me, Australian, and so that that could be. A, a townhouse, what we call a townhouse, uh, a house and land or plot and plan, um, or it could be an apartment as well. So it's and it's relative to the income versus um, versus the mortgage. So just to give you an idea, um, this here, all these stats, we, we we don't just pluck them. We pluck them. We we take them from um, various sources like the National Housing Supply Council. Oops, I'll just go back there. Uh, that's a that's a body that's set up to monitor this sort of ongoing issue that we have. So, and this just sort of highlights, <coughs> excuse me, that accumulative gap uh, nationally that that's growing year on year, and it's simply because we don't have enough developers or builders, if you like, to close that gap at this point in time, and we can't release enough uh, developed or developed uh, land. That, that builders can build on and build new apartments, build new townhouses in that affordable bracket. So they are trying to place more measures um, whereby the infrastructure is there. Uh, it's 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 speedier process because we are a red tape country as well. Um, so we're not getting that supply out. Um, so moving forward, um, Scott asked me to that direct question. Uh, and I'm just skipping here, Scott. So just jump in any time you want. If, if I'm, I'm going up. I'm just aware of of people spending their evening there. Uh, well, this, this to time, us. No, just I mean, look, Richard. From my perspective, um, obviously, I, you know, in terms of your, your preparation with the slides, what I wanted to do was before we just get into that into that detail. Um, and again, if uh, if uh, I um, I just want to go back to some of the questions that I had here quickly uh, from from my side. And then, and then uh, we can come back to the apartments or houses or where people should look um, in terms of the, the different options. Because one of the things that, that I think is very important, you, you know, you answered the question here in terms of what's happening in the Australian market. And I actually just wanted to share with people quickly, you, you spoke quite a lot about that RP data. And <clears throat> when one looks at the RP data report, you know, this is something that comes out uh, every single month. Um, if anyone wants to know, and Richard's mentioned it already, if anyone wants to know where the best information is, you don't have to be a rocket scientist, it's available, go, it's available to everybody. So you can see exactly what's going on. It's not written by an estate agent or a bank. And so it's, it is what it is in terms of the market. But if I was to ask you, Richard, if, you know, if I was to look at just some of these stats and, and what's happening, um, you know, places like uh, Sydney are, are seeing returns of 18%, Melbourne 11%, Brisbane 11%. Um, you can see the medium prices there, six fifty five in Sydney. Uh, just for South Africans, uh, that means the average price of a house in Sydney is uh, costing you about seven million rand. Um, so you know, if you're thinking of moving there one day, uh, this stuff is very, very important. In Brisbane, four forty. Uh, so over five million rand just for a very average house, uh, three three bedroom, two bathroom, uh, four bedroom, two bathroom in a, in the suburbs. Um, but I wanted to ask you, Richard, you know, when I look at the best performing capital city in terms of growth is, is Sydney. Uh, when one looks here at the, um, at the combined capital, Sydney's growth versus the other areas um, and, and, you know, over the last 12 months, et cetera. What are, what are your thoughts from someone who's on the ground, who understands the market um, and also the way the market moves in cycles where Sydney tends to lead a market, 
Melbourne tends to follow and markets like Brisbane, you know, tend to lag two, three years behind. What, what, is, what do you read when you right. see all these uh, stats and figures? Basically, um, from a investor's point of view, Scott, I, I see where the demand's going now, and that's shifting to Brisbane, and you're seeing that now. A lot of, a lot of the Australian investors, this is, this is normally the cycle of what happens. You, you're correct in saying Sydney goes first, Melbourne follows, then Brisbane. So what traditionally happens is you're starting to get a lot of interstate inquiry from Sydney and Melbourne, and that's the sign. So the, so over the next two years, you're going to find that, that surge where there's a big demand, uh, a project, a key project might be released in a key area, and it disappears very quickly, and that's actually happening. Uh, one of the biggest apartment builders released uh, one of their new developments in a place called Newstead, which is very close to the Brisbane CBD, and the whole 79 apartments disappeared by the Saturday, and they released it on the Friday. So, and a lot of those went to interstate investors, and the investors now, because of the affordability issues in Sydney and Melbourne, are now, of course, following that trend, that historical trend, and now looking at places like Brisbane. I just wanted to show you, you've spoken a bit about the affordability. I just wanted to show people in terms of that affordability, if you look back to 1975, you can actually see there Australia um, and, and house prices in the UK. And this is why that, you know, they've sustainably risen. And this is why that affordability is, is, is so important in terms of what people look at. And I mean, this is the, the research from The Economist. You can see prices in real terms, prices against income, um, you know, prices against uh, rents, and you can also see the percentage change. And the only reason I'm showing you this is that it's critically important to understand what, what is happening in Australia and, and also which segments of the market. Because the one thing I learned a long time ago about Australia that Richard taught me was that you can't tell me that Perth, uh, the market's good just because it's good in Perth, because it doesn't work like that. It can be literally um, plummeting in Perth and rising in Sydney and vice versa. And equally, the market at the top end in Sydney can be losing 20% and the affordable sector, you know, the three four hundred thousand uh, dollar homes where the mom and pops, two, you know, mom and dad and two kids want to live. Um, can can be experiencing you know a lot of growth. So I'm just trying to kind of show people the different stats, Richard, and then get your nuances in terms of what what is happening in terms of where the market is is and what's happening sure. you know on the ground. Okay, sure. Tell me just something in terms of um, over the last ten years. I'm going to open another poll for people, but just from your experience, you said you've spoken about uh, the last uh, you know you've been investors for the last ten years. Just. Just at a high level, you don't need to show us slides and stuff, but my point is from your perspective, what, what's kind of happened? If we go back to, to 2004, um, we know the world kind of had a boom period um, from call it 2002 onwards. Um, what kind of happened from your experience between the different cities, the, the market as a whole, uh, going into the crisis, <clears throat> post the crisis, and, and kind of where we are now from your experience as an investor? Okay, just back in, in, in 2004, uh, everybody was investing because it was, it was a boom time then, and your average price um, a, across the board was half of what it is now in every capital city. Um, personally, I, I bought a, an investment property that was 220000 and even, even today that's 450000 and that, that's a valuation that I've had done on it. Every capital city tends to... It, it tends to be relative. So, so the, if the median value in, in Melbourne was three hundred thousand um, for an apartment in Richmond, then you would find that ten years down the track, two thousand and fourteen, just like our historical past, uh, that's the value that it would be selling for today. So, it, it's pretty pretty clear cut, Scott. I know th there's a lot of nuances in in all of the cities, but ten years ago. Uh, they said that property would double in another 10 years. Nobody believed it, and it did. And, um, and I've seen that happen in every capital city, and, uh, and, and, I, and I do believe that moving forward there's going to be a slower growth now because we're coming into a different time. But with the fundamentals behind us, we're going to see that type, of, that type of future again. Maybe not 10 years, but probably the 15 to sort of 20-year mark, I think. And I mean, look, just from my side, I mean, you know, I, um, as you know, I started investing with you in 2008. And I mean, my understanding prior to 2008 is somewhere like Perth boomed. 
um, and it and it lagged uh, behind Sydney because Sydney kind of took off quite quite a lot from 2002 to say 2005, and then it had you yeah. know it, it kind of peaked out with its growth, and then it went fairly stagnant, and then somewhere like Perth actually boomed um, up to 2008, but then it actually kind of fell upon hard times once um, once the whole uh, global financial crisis started and the whole commodities thing um, started to down downplay. But what I found fascinating in Australia is that when the global financial crisis happened. Interest rates were sitting at 8.75%. I'll never forget it. And in four months, they dropped them to 3%. So basically, from a from a you know an investor's perspective, two things happen in the market. The first thing is that interest rates drop by plus minus 66%. So as a South African, if you take into account that our interest rates at the time were 15.5%, that's like the South African Reserve Bank dropping them to 5%. Um, so it made affordability very very quickly, and and it really made it made a big impact. They also brought in a first-time homeowners allowance in March of 2009, which propped up the market. And if you look at any stats on the market, there was a little blimp for like three months in 2009. But in 2009, the Australian economy was the only one in the G20 to actually uh, not go into recession. And the property market grew by 8.6%. And actually, we did really well from the properties that we bought in 2009, 2010. We had, we had strong growth. But then the back end of 2010, um, they started to get worried about inflationary pressures, and so they started to put up interest rates. And I stand to be corrected, Richard, but I think they put them up eight times um, mm, that's at point two five percent. Now people think you know, point in, in South Africa, if it went up by point two five percent, we wouldn't even blink. But when you consider that you know, point two five percent eight times, that's two percent. But where you were already sitting at three percent to go up two percent means that it goes up to five percent. It's virtually like it's doubled. Uh, well, it's 40% in, in, in perspective. So in any rising interest rate cycle, the market tends to slow again. And, and that's really, you know, when, when one looks at these graphs um, back, to, back to RP data, and there's, you can actually see the market here in terms of the rolling averages. Um, you can actually see what's happened in terms of the market. And there's actually a better one later on. Um, where's it gone now? of the market at large. But anyway, let's just use that one for now um, in terms of the blips and the falls in terms of the market. But I think, you know, really we, we've gone through a rising interest rate cycle for the last, say, two years, and the market tended to go quite sideways. Uh, there wasn't a huge amount of product coming to the market. I know for a couple of years we could pick up some pretty good product where developers went bankrupt because uh, that always tends to happen when, when interest rates rise. But from my understanding, and again, I, I'd like to ask your opinion on this, Richard, you know, we can see now prices are starting to rise. Demand is there. Um, people, you know, don't want to be tenants anymore. They, they want to get back in the market. The confidence has, has come back. But the supply is not there, which I presume is why the prices are starting to rise again. Um, and, and, you know, we seem to be going into the next cycle. Um, are you in agreement with that? Um, or or what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, in general, I am. Yes, of course, it, it, it comes down to each um, individual location so for example going back to the slide I brought up before the, the those capital cities like Sydney Melbourne and Brisbane for example and to a certain degree Perth uh, they do have a, a shortage across the board in apartments townhouses and, and and house and land so there's not a shortage in, in top-end properties as I said right at the beginning the, the shortage is is in what the mass part of our market here in Australia, that's the mum and dads, that, that, which makes up 75% of the purchases. And, I, and I'm talking about the Australians who buy property here. Um, that's 75% of, of our buying population. And it's, it's in that market, Scott, where more and more people now are being forced out of it because of the, the, that sustained price growth. And here's where it gets interesting for investors because more and more Australians are settling to rent. And, and that's the predictions moving forward in, in, um, in the future, is that we can't necessarily make property any cheaper. We, we can't physically develop land. We can't put up a high-rise tower. We can't make a townhouse development any cheaper than the costs. So now the way people look at things is, can I afford this mortgage of $450,000 now or is it better off for me to rent? And, and now what you're seeing, and, and, and this, is, this is the trend in, in these markets, in these affordable markets, is people are moving towards a, a rental lifestyle. 
and, and they're happy with that. So the opportunities for investors um, long term are in this affordable market, if that makes sense, Scott. Perfect. And I mean, I just, you know, and again, you must, you must correct me if I'm wrong, because, you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, which is the best state or city? And what you're saying is that you've already kind of shown us the stats based on, on the population demand and the population growth um, and the interstate. And also the, I always find it interesting that more South Africans are immigrating to Brisbane than to Perth, you know, that things have changed dramatically. But, um, but, but more importantly is actually the sector of the market as well, which is the affordable sector. And just to reiterate what you said, 75% of the population is in that affordable bracket, um, earning between thirty and $50,000 a, a year. They can earn up to six times the income, which means that an individual can earn, say, three hundred can get a mortgage for like $300,000, you know, with a mom and uh, with a, with a mom and a dad together, you know, they can probably be touching somewhere between kind of 300 and 500. And that's very much the sector that I always understood as in the affordable sector. Is that still the case, Richard? Yeah, no, absolutely. Look, again, obviously a place like Sydney, your, your, your average income I'm talking about is a bit higher. So combined it would be $110,000. That's, that's the current average. In a place like Brisbane, it's more like, like 80,000 and Melbourne's 90,000. So, so each, each yeah, yeah, sorry. relative. So I was just I'm saying gonna, each city is relative. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to ask another poll quickly. And while I do, I just want uh, everyone's, uh, everyone's thoughts as to what it is that they're interested in. Um, and then I'm going to go back to you and let you answer the question as to what's the best uh, between, you know, houses, apartments, if there's something else. But one of the things while people are answering that poll is that um, – you know, Richard comes out to South Africa, uh, uh, well, many he's been out here many, many times. In fact, he met his wife out in South Africa. Um, so um, I know that you know, you know this country well. But um, just because, and I'd like to think it was because he was coming to, to you know, talk to me and, and our team and, and our investors, but I'm sure it's the fact that the Springboks are playing the All Blacks at Ellis Park on Saturday. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but Richard's actually coming out here on, uh, on Friday. Uh, he's here for the week. And we'll be sitting down with all our current clients. He's doing a CMA, which stands for Comparative Market Analysis, um, so that they can analyze where their properties are. You know, as I said, we've helped uh, you know a couple of hundred people invest since since 2008, and we want to be able to look at those properties. What's happening? Where's the market? Where's the opportunity? Review financing options. And um, one of the things that that he's also going to be doing is talking about the market where there are residential opportunities, whether it's residential or commercial or possibly even development opportunities. Um, there's the opportunity to get involved. You know, Henny, Henny and myself uh, went over many years ago. I, I can't remember if it was 2008 or 2009. Met with Richard. Richard showed us opportunities. And, you know, Henny, Henny and them started with $4 million and, um, and actually turned it into $40 million in about four and a half years. And that was by doing residential developments very much focused in this uh, in this affordable bracket that uh, that Richard's talking so much about. So there's different opportunities, and and the good news is is that um, you know there's also going to be crowdfunding opportunities in in this space. So I am um, I can see that we've got the poll there. I can see about 66 percent of people have voted. So if anyone else wants to uh, just to vote quickly, and then Richard, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen back to you if you don't mind. Um, and uh, and we can answer that question as to whether houses, apartments, or something else is better. Um, Yaku is online. That Yaku is our, our CEO and the brains behind the operation. And um, he actually told me that we've got so many clients that want to sit with Richard that we only have six meetings left. Uh, that's across all the cities. So in Joburg, Pretoria, Durban, and Cape Town, uh, we only have six uh, time slots left. Um, so if you are interested in meeting with Richard, just type in meeting. Um, it will be on a first come first serve basis, but um, and we can we can hopefully try and set up a meeting this time. If we can't, uh, we'll have to set up a, a meeting next time. But uh, if you are interested, just type in the in the question box meeting, and um, and you will be able to you know hopefully have an opportunity. The other option, a lot of you have heard about our bias trips. Um, I'm leaving South Africa on the 21st of October. I'll be spending a week with Richard and Raleen and looking at opportunities in Australia. Um, so if you're interested in the bias trip, just type in bias trip, um, and you can either come with us to Australia or I can be your ears and eyes uh, on the ground in terms of actually helping out. So let me close that poll. Um, I will just share the results quickly because I'm sure people are interested. So residential is 77, commercial 43, funds 11, syndication 17, 
and crowdfunding 37. So, Richard, I'm going to go back to, to your screen um, and to answer that question that, that the age-old question always wants to know, people always want to know, is, is what should I be investing in? And uh, hang on, I just uh, need to give you back your screen here. Uh, why has it not gone to your presenter? All right, hide results. Okay, now we should be back to you. Yeah. Can you see me? Uh, it's coming up. Just wait. Have you said share? Have you said uh, show your screen? Not yet. We're still just yes. seeing the, the screen. Um, Thank you. Okay, let's try that again. Uh, okay. Try that. Where have you gone? Richard, Richard, Richard. Why is it not showing me? Okay, hang on, dude. I'm just going to make myself back the presenter and then give it back to you um, because for some reason it's not okay. giving showing us the screen. So, gotta love go to webinar. <laughs> Always keeps me on my toes. <laughs> um, right, let's go back to you, and I'm giving you back the screen. Uh, make sure Richard presenter. Click OK. Make OK. Okay, so now you should be able to just go uh, show okay. screen. Sure. Okay. Okay. So we're back. We're Hopefully back. You can, so, uh, so yeah, if you can, uh, if you can just show us and 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 answer some of those questions, um, you know, like what is the best to invest in between houses and apartments? Are there better things? What are some of the risks? What are some of the opportunities, etc. Okay. Um, perhaps if I give a little bit of, um, I guess, insight into what a major developer would invest their money into. Uh, they're always a good bet, basically, and I, and I, and and to just take a few minutes to explain how I've seen the successful developments, successful areas take off in Australia, and it's it's something that we often forget about being such a big country, and this is relative to residential and um, and commercial, and 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 I'm and what I want to explain here is Australia is governed by uh, development or town planning borders. Uh, if, if and what I've got on the screen here, just to highlight this, is is Melbourne. This is um, the grey area. There uh, is is a plan, is a town future town planning area. It was originally called uh, the Melbourne 2030. So what that, that means is that purple line around the outside of the grey area that was set many years ago as the development area until. Uh, the year 2030. So anything outside of that could never be built. If you had farmland, if you had possible uh, development land, forget it. It was it was never. They weren't even going to look at it until 2030. Now what's happened is they've changed it twice now because of the population growth. And um, you can see there, there's a, there's a yellow area. Um, they're, this is they've added to this because of the growth over the the, the the growth has been greater than what they they assumed, and so the the local governments have increased that. They've now called it Melbourne Five Million, so the population will get to five million by the year twenty twenty five. Um, so they changed the plan. They they revise it and realise, gee, we've still got a shortage here. We need to spend more of the state government's um, money on infrastructure. And, and open up more areas to development. And, and, and it's not a case of just saying, there's a big plot of land, let's build on it. They've got to provide infrastructure by the way of motorways, trains, and, and so forth. So all development centers in this. Every city's the same, every town's the same. So it can't, and, and that, that's quite restrictive, but they're very, very large areas. But those shaded yellow areas you're seeing on this Melbourne 5 million, that's that's a big area, but this is what they need, medium term uh, projection to keep up with the population growth, and that that comes back to that that housing shortage, and it, it's and I just wanted to point this out because um, there's two reasons you can understand why there's a why they say there's a housing shortage because they wouldn't pump uh, millions of dollars into these areas to provide infrastructure if if it wasn't necessary. So I just wanted to point that out that every capital city's very similar. They have their own town plan, and I'm just going to use Melbourne as an example. So whether it's residential, whether it's townhouses, there's various suburbs within these cities. It's it's the town plan 
that, that the developers work off. Here's the infrastructure plan. So this is what the state government's going to be spending just on, on roads along. There's billions of dollars worth of future um, infrastructure going in, and that's just to support this this extra development, this this booming population. So this is how they look at it. And a little bit of a tip here. This this goes for residential and commercial. I've just tried to keep it very simple. Uh, we, we'd normally work on a on a hundred point system. There's ten layers to it, and hopefully you can you can follow me quite clearly here. Now, if, I, if we're developers and we're looking at growth areas uh, inside those boundaries, inside that town planning area, this is how we do it in Australia to get a successful development. And, and as I said, it's relative to commercial and residential. So we look at the 10 layer system up here, and there's 10 points along here. Each one of these 10 points has a further 10 boxes, which are over on the right hand side. So, for example, here we've got layer 7, which is infrastructure. So we've got to meet a certain criteria, um, and I'm just going to use this infrastructure example. So we, we want to know that it's near high schools, where it's near its primary schools. Is there a university? Is there a hospital? So we give it a rating out of 10. And if we go through this properly, we should be able to come up with a, with a rating to of whether or not there's going to be um, several areas of success here. And, and from a developer's point of view, obviously, you want it to be a successful development that people want to live in, and that's that's it's all targeted to Australian buyers. It's it's all centered around Australian buyers. So you can you can you, there's no crystal ball as we know in investing in real estate, but if you follow some certain principles, this hundred point system, most of of the major developers use this. There's there's obviously a few more deeper levels involved, but if you're ticking off these boxes and rating these developments, these opportunities. Uh, I'll be doing this for the IPS um, product that comes through. You should be able to take this model no matter where you are, whether it be the US, whether it be the UK, and apply these basic principles to give yourself a pretty good um, long-term uh, strategy for your investment and, and to decide whether it's, a, um, whether it's a good investment. And this principle is is the backbone of all development. So going back to that plan there, uh, that's a big area of Mitchell, Melbourne. So we would be looking at yeah. Can I just jump in? Um, I do want to reiterate that Yaku and Brendan are both online, and um, they now realise that I'm not as intelligent as they thought because uh, when I showed them that we should have the hundred point plan on where to invest in America, they were very impressed. But I think they now know where it came from. <laughs> well. Um, look, you learn something every day, don't we? So, <laughs> um, but, but just for the viewers out there, this is, I think if you apply these principles, no matter what it is, you're going to get the same sort of successes to a, to a certain degree um, that we have in the development space. So uh, inside that, that grey area, there would be opportunities, there would be land banks, there would be commercial zoned um, development opportunities. So we would go through that process looking at all opportunities from a, so just, just, a, a just residential quickly. investment. Just, dude, just quickly, mm. just point with your with your mouse to Point Cook, uh, where Point Cook is. Yeah, here. Yeah. So down there you can see where his mouse is on the screen. So I go there in 2008, 2009, and Richard goes, this is going to be a major development area. I'm like, dude, it's a farmland. Like there are cows. Like I can't see a single thing. Like I don't know what you're talking about. It is amazing, and I, and I know, again, I use even Yaku and Brendan here um, from an experience perspective where it's amazing, like, and I say to them, like, guys, the beauty of dealing in the first world is that you literally go out to a farm field and they go, guys, one day this will be like an entire town center with schools and shops and retail and everything and 10,000 houses, and you're like, yeah, whatever, dude. Um, and you come back three years later and it's all there. Um, and Point Cook is, is a classic example of that where, you know, I have pictures of that where literally I have a bunch of cars standing around a field. You can see the Melbourne background uh, way in the distance. It's about 20 k's, I think, if I stand corrected, from Melbourne. And yeah. yet you go back today and it's one of the most successful, like, city hubs of, of Melbourne. And I just wanted – I mean, that's just a personal experience of what you're talking about. And the one thing in the first world that's so much easier is that when the city says it's going to grow in a certain direction and they're going to put schools and shops and roads in – 
they actually do that before they build the houses, not like here where we build the houses and then can't um, supply the water and electricity, and so everything's a bit of a gamble. Yeah, just, just not dwelling on that too much, but just to back up what Scott's saying, um, that estate alone, that one called Point Cook, uh, about 25 kilometres from Brisbane, uh, from Melbourne CBD, that, that had been on the news several times here because people, local people, were camped on site two days before the land releases, so it was selling that fast um, back in 2008, 2009. I think you remember that time too, Scott. Yeah, uh, we, where I was we, urging um, you to. We got a number of clients into that. Not as many as we I would have liked to, because you were so adamant that it was going to be good. But the ones we did get in have, have done extremely well there. Yeah, so that's that's good news. But hopefully that just sort of explains it a little bit. I don't want to make it too complicated. Obviously, there's deeper levels to this. But if if you follow it, uh, the basic system, understanding Australia that we we have a town planning platform around every city um, and it's a and it's a guide and within that that's where all the work's done so hopefully that was just fairly clear for everybody there um, Scott did you want me to just touch on the the finance well before, side of sorry, before you before you go to the finance options I um, you had a slide um, in terms of what is better between kind of houses apartments um, that I think we skipped over unless I wasn't concentrating properly um, it was that one. Okay. Well, basically, um, I would like people not to dwell on this too much because inside that area that I showed you, whether, whether it's Brisbane, Sydney, or Melbourne, there are great opportunities for plot and plan houses. There are fantastic opportunities for certain apartment blocks, and there are equally good opportunities for what we call townhouse developments, which is, Scott, you call them? No, townhouse. Townhouse is perfect. No, no, townhouse. Townhouse is actually, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so uh, as long as it fits that criteria, as I said before, of, of affordability, affordable to, to purchase, affordable to rent, and, and that that's for the, the mass market. So there are going to be these opportunities coming coming your way. Um, to present to, to, to people, Scott, that will be within those guidelines and within those boundaries. There really is no one thing. There's certain areas, yes, that that has that that really stands out. But I just wanted to point it out that over the long term, they they basically perform perform the same. But in simple, so in simple terms, if I understand you correctly, it's not about whether it's a house or whether it's an apartment or whether it's a townhouse. Um, it's actually more about the pricing point. Um, and if I go back to your 100-point uh, slide, it's correct, more about correct. the location, the infrastructure, the schools, you know, all the kind of common sense stuff. And, and again, you know, ladies and gentlemen, correct. the thing that I learned many, many years ago is that, you know, we had an office in London, we had an office in Dubai, we had three offices in South Africa at the time, and, and our model up until I met Richard was always to go to, go to a country, set up an office, employ the people, and to try and do it ourselves. And when I met Richard and, and Phil Kelly and Sarah and, and Louis Faree all those years ago, they just had such sophisticated systems. I mean, they, they, their company had been going since 1987. Um, there was so much experience in the market that, that I thought to myself, you know, it's absolutely crazy to try and go and reinvent the wheel rather than just partner with the best in the industry. And, um, and that's what I suppose tonight we, we're trying to share with you. And, and the whole purpose of Richard coming out to South Africa is to sit with people and to be able to to share with that on a one-to-one -one basis once he understands what it is they're trying to achieve. And equally, when you go on a buyer's trip and you you, you get to experience what I've had the privilege of experiencing, which is getting on the ground and actually see, seeing it seeing it with your own eyes. Richard, before you get onto the financing side, though, just just answer for me. You know, the the the, the, the age-old question that I think most people should always be asking is, you know, it's it's one thing to ask what the opportunities are, but in your mind, what are the risks? And what are the opportunities that the people should be should be focusing on before we before we get into the financing? And and, and while we do that, I'm going to just share another poll quickly um, to to understand where people where we, where people are at. Okay, aside from the the obvious um, hundred point check, if we if we want to call it that for for ease, um, realistically in in Australia, if you if you're within those boundaries and considering afford, afford, the affordability factor, then generally that's the market. I, I know it's fairly broad speaking, but they are sort of substantial areas, Scott. 
but it's when you go outside of that and you go to a lifestyle product, uh, and what I mean by that is is an apartment overlooking the ocean where you're paying twice the amount um, that you could do in a high growth area, but because it's on the ocean, you, you're paying a substantial amount of more, and the and the rent return's not going to be there, and that to me is is where a lot of people have fallen down, and and many Australian investors too have fallen down. Um, because the income that you rely on is not there to sustain it. So that, that's a big mistake um, that hopefully everybody can avoid. Um, opportunities I mean, just, wise, just an example, that's like what happened on the Gold Coast where guys got cleaned up seven low. Yeah, look, don't don't be put off by the Gold Coast because you, you do hear a lot of that, but don't forget the, the Commonwealth Games is arriving here in 2018 and the, I showed you the town planning map of um, Melbourne. Well, the Gold Coast is nearly full. Hey, there's there's virtually not much land available. It's the town planning, as I showed you. They're not going to extend it any further. It's actually going to come up towards Brisbane. So that area we talked about many moons ago, Scott and Coomera, for people, if they could just hold on, that whole thing is going is is joining together as we said it would. But the Gold Coast, for example, um, is a misunderstood market. There's a lot. It's very much like Sydney. You know, two two million, three million dollar homes dropped dramatically. But the affordable market, there wasn't an affordable market. But now developers are getting a little bit more cunning, and they're trying to create those affordable products. So if you can find, which we we have in the pipeline, if you can find an affordable quality product that meets everything that I just said, that to me is an absolute winner on the Gold Coast. It's it's there's a, just a big difference between that top end market. So, uh, because again, because the Gold Coast is a city. So don't forget, Australia's got the Commonwealth Games. That's a big factor down there as well. One other thing that you taught me from a risk perspective that, you know, I just wanted to mention was that you always said to me, you know, in your opinion, it was better to stick to the capital cities. Um, once you start trying to chase the mining towns, you sometimes get it right and you sometimes get it wrong. And, and there's, there's a lot of kind of... Um, volatility as to whether the mining's booming and then there's a lot of demand or the mining's waning or whether there's an oversupply of property or et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, you said from your experience, sometimes you might get better returns up in the mining towns, but but on the on on the whole, at large, it's more risky. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I personally uh, would recommend staying away from mining towns. Um when you talk to Australian investors, they go to mining towns for the promised high returns. And as we all understand, um, and, and it's clear what's happening in, in Australia to a certain degree at the moment with the price of coal and the demand and, and, the, and the sort of tapering off of China's demand at the moment, there goes the jobs, they follow. And that is something that you're seeing a little bit of at the moment. If you, if you follow the mining community, which I do as well, that developments tapered off, people leave those towns and they're normally one economy centred um, town. So not like living in Brisbane where you've got a multitude of different industries. Uh, it, in the mining town areas, if that tapers off um, and, and there's no guarantees that these things will last for 50 years because that company can just turn around and, and turn the tap off and the whole town suffers. And, and you've seen that quite a bit here. And the, t the returns can be very promising on paper, but long term I think the risks can be very high. Um, so so I, I would definitely recommend sticking within that model I said, something that's affordable, people want to rent, it's got a great opportunity for growth, it's centered around all demand. Um, that's the best advice I would give my, uh, my own family. So tell me then, obviously, you've, you've discussed the opportunities, um, and I don't think we need to focus on that because you've, you've been into quite a lot of detail, but what are the financing options? You know, um, I know that there's quite a few, you know, regulations and, and, and opportunities in terms of, you know, being a, a non-resident, but what, what, what can I borrow? I know, as an example, in America, we've had huge problems, but yet in Australia, we've always been able to, you know, be able to get financing for clients. So where are we at with financing um, currently? Yeah, basically, it hasn't changed too much. The only thing that's changed really for non-residents is more banks are willing to lend than when we first started off, Scott. So you're finding all your majors don't want to miss out on on the offshore investors. So, 
as a golden rule, um, it's a minimum of 20% deposit. Some people prefer to put more in, but a minimum of 20% deposit, whereas if you're a resident of Australia, it's, it's around 10% deposit. So it's just obviously a risk, um, a risk factor there which gives you that higher, uh, higher LVR. Uh, there's, as I've got there, you can clearly read, I won't go into it too much, but there's a principal and interest mortgages and there's interest only mortgages. So as an investor, um, what we, as we've always done in the past, we, we put as many options on the table and go around to as many banks as we can to get that best deal. And I've just got a little uh, note on, on the bottom there. We've got a, uh, what I call a private banking solution. It's, it's a small group of people I've worked with for, for the past 20 years. They're very uh, skilled in residential uh, mortgages and commercial mortgages. Uh, they give this the one-on-one -on -one service. If you want to talk to them prior to doing something, they'll start searching around for you. Uh, Tony, who heads that up, he's, he's, uh, he's the grey-haired variety. He, he speaks to all the major banks, uh, is independent to IPS, but he's, he's willing to work very closely with us. And he's helped a lot of the clients that, that we've been working with um, over the past to find the best deal. So what I really mean there is very basically speaking 20% deposit and shop it around as, as the Australians do here. So and, and the, the interest rates are very low, we're expecting them to be down for quite some time. Um, so the opportunity is there to get a very good rate. Okay. And I mean, just in terms of simple terms, do you reckon we can get up to as high as an 80% loan to value or what do you, what do you think basically? Yep, I do. And it, it just depends again, uh, remember how we have this exchange control in South Africa, Scott? So it just absolutely, we can get the 20%. Uh, um, I, I just wasn't sure how the exchange control uh, situation is there at the moment. You might be able to elaborate well, that. Well, we're allowed to take five uh, million. Four million rand with the one million discretionary per person, so it's effectively five million rand per person per year. So I mean, it's a substantial okay. amount of cash people can take out, and with being able to get access to eighty percent financing, then then obviously you can uh, you can look at it. So just just as my interest from from your perspective, um, what type of rates are, would I be looking at being able to borrow at the moment? About five, around about five to five and a half. So our cash rate is two and a half and it's always pretty much the same here that the major banks are always about the the same again so if, they, if they're buying it for two two dollars fifty then uh, sorry 2.5 then they're going to offer it out retail at, at around about five percent so there's there's a lot of options that's why we like to put it out get everybody's details put it out to as many banks as possible quote if you like uh, and then then come back with all the best option but as we know it's the same in South Africa it doesn't necessarily, the, the cheapest rate doesn't necessarily mean the best deal because there's different fee structures and all that sort of thing. But that's why we try and break it down um, and give people the best options. Okay. So so just with regards to, you know, if I uh, I want to launch another poll here just quickly before we go into those uh, four reasons. But if, if I was to say, you know, the unique advantages uh, in terms of beating the averages in Australia, you know, I think you've alluded to a lot of them, but um, from from your perspective, what would you say are the are the kind of the top three things um, that people need to focus on to be able to beat beat the averages in Australia? Scott, I think I've I've given you a pretty significant, um, uh, I guess, most Australian investors don't understand the principles of a hundred point check system, and and really. It's 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 the fundamentals that we all talk about. You talk about the fundamentals fundamentals of global investing. We all know that if the property is has transport or it's, or it's located in an area where there's schools and university and that type of thing, you're gonna have more demand for people. If you like it in that area, people are gonna like it to rent. They're gonna like it to buy if you need to sell it in the future. So I think the best advice I can give somebody without really zeroing in on the opportunities we're going to bring to the market in South Africa uh, that we've sourced is follow those fundamentals and tick those boxes and go for a score over 85% and long term that's going to have the, the desired impact that, that you want. Less hassle and opportunity for growth and um, 
if needed to down the track, something that somebody else is going to want to buy. Okay. And then um, let me just, uh, if anyone uh, wants to just quickly finish up that poll, something that I learned quite quickly, you know, when I came over in 2008 is that there's actually four reasons um, to own Australian property if, if one is thinking of moving there. Now, when I say thinking of moving there, you know, I personally am not necessarily thinking of moving to Australia right now. But should I leave uh, Nisna, which is where I love living, you know, I would I would move to 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 Brisbane. And, um, you know, there's there's four major reasons that the people need to be able to understand that and, and focus on that. And I just wanted to, you know, ask you, you, you shared it with me all those years ago. And, and then I just wanted to add my personal two cents on that uh, based on your thoughts. Sure. Um, sorry, Scott, you just dropped out a little bit there. I missed the la I missed the last bit. Apologies. Oh, We're going sorry, so well. Know, but no, I'm not sure why I dropped off. But um, no, what I was saying is, I just want to know your thoughts in terms of um, you know, there's there's I learned uh, back in 2008. There's four major reasons uh, for actually owning property if if someone yeah. is thinking of moving there one day down down the down the uh, down the road. Yeah. No, absolutely. Look, I think. Um, you know, I, I've got them up on the screen there. Th these are the four obvious ones. Um, we, we'll touch on the, the historically through, as it says there, through through all the 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 outside effects, if you like, disasters, wars, recessions, the GFC. On average, since they've been taking records, we've managed to sustain a pretty a pretty good run. Um, I don't think you're going to see, in all honesty, that that sort of return. But look, I think in the next ten years or so. Um, we're going to have that sort of sustained forecast, nice gradual um, increases uh, due to all of the the factors that we've covered. Um, it's very safe, it's reliable. Uh, people are there to rent the property. Um, people are. It, it's a safe country to to invest in. Uh, nobody's going to steal things out of the property. That type of thing. We can. It's it's easily replaced. We've proven that over and over again, Scott. Um, the the obvious ones. That, that are in front of us are the tax advantages as well for a, for a non-resident. Um, just explain, just like that, just explain that a little bit though, Richard, because it's not obvious to us in South Africa. We pay tax in all directions mm. and get no no kickback for anything. It's sure. 21 of the Tax Act, yeah. Okay, basically, you 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 have an accountant here, which we we help source one that's that understands um, people's uh, needs from offshore. Very simply, you put in a tax return on that property. Um, you can claim a lot of things in Australia, depreciation, trips to come out here, um, various costs there, there are involved, for example, uh, agents letting fees, uh, any maintenance, um, depreciation is, is normally around the sort of eight, nine, ten thousand dollars on a brand new property every year, uh, any shortfall or anything that you've had to top up, the, the, in, the interest is um, tax deductible. So that can amount up every year, and of course you can't take it out of the country. But if you sold, you can offset that against any capital gains. And as it's got there quite clearly, it's accumulative. So every year you're putting in this tax return, it's sitting there. So if you decided to move out here one day uh, and you start working, you can use that accumulated tax loss to offset any income that you earn, or you can, as I said before, you can offset it against any capital gains tax. The capital gains you pay when as a, as a non-resident. So if you kept it for five years, decided to sell it, um, you you pay less than than Australians do, which they are. <laughs> I have to say they are looking at um, at the moment. But um, yeah, there's a lot of tax advantages. We'll normally give pe set people up with the right people here. Uh, very simple. They do it for you. Small fee every year. Uh, set and forget, and it just accumulates with the tax department. So it's nice to get something back. Um, and the other ones we'll just touch on quick here. As Scott knows, credit rating is very big in Australia. It might seem like a very small thing, um, but the amount of people that have uh, moved from various countries and, and struggle to even get a mobile phone contract because the banks just don't know who you are. So obviously, it's doing something from uh, the advantages of investing can set you up for the future with credit rating when you get here rather than trying to, to spend the next nine or ten months building up a credit rating. Um, and immigration, purchasing property in advance, um, significant positive step as I've got there. It's always seen very favourably. It doesn't mean 
that you're guaranteed to to get a visa or anything like that. But it's certainly a positive step in in the in the immigration department's eyes. So um, those sort of four uh, uh, key features, if you like, um, they're the sort of ones that I would I would certainly like to go into a little bit more detail. We probably brushed over them a little bit, Scott. But each one has has a lot more sort of um, uh, detail. I think you'd agree. Yeah, just just one thing that's quite important there, the credit rating, people really underestimate the credit rating, and I learned this even from my uncle. You know, he went over there, bought a house mm. for $1.8 million cash and couldn't get a credit card, couldn't get a cell phone uh, for over a year. So, you know, we, we came up with that whole concept, start living before you leave, and, you know, it's building up that credit rating. And, and yes, on the immigration side, you know, someone here, Graham Paddock, has asked um, about uh, um, if you're over 60. I don't know, Graham, if you're asking about the immigration or the finance um, but there are ways and means. You know, my uncle immigrated to Australia when he was 53. Um, there are ways of doing it. Ian Hawthorne and Brett Carney asked, what structure do you suggest? Um, it is different and it is complicated for people, but ironically in Australia, um, we, don't get, uh, we don't get fancy air. The banks look straight, straight through structures uh, and there's very little protection offered um, by having you know, double trusts and some of the fun, fancy stuff that I've heard. So most of our clients, more than 90% of our clients, have actually bought the properties in their in their own names, unless they had an offshore structure and they had other reasons. Um, again, neither Richard nor I are, 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 are structuring experts, but we've certainly got the people that we've worked with in the past um, to assist each and every person, you know, to, to come up with uh, with what what it is they're looking for. Um, I am cons- I am conscious of the time, Richard, and um, you know, most conscious of the fact that it's nearly four o'clock in the morning your time, but. Um, just a little bit on commercial property. You know, we get asked this all the time, the difference between residential and commercial. We've spoken a lot about residential tonight. We've obviously helped people in both residential and commercial, both in Australia, um, you know, and, and the U.S. Um, and the U.K., et cetera, by, and South Africa. So we've got substantial, particularly with our partners, we've got substantial um, experience in the commercial market. And, you know, we've got a number of investors that want either or or both. What's your experience from the commercial perspective in Australia? Uh, look, I, I think um, commercial. This, I'd just be adding a few more layers to that hundred-point check. Um, you know, when you're looking at commercial property, there's industrial, uh, obviously retail opportunities, uh, and and I can tell you there is. Uh, I, I, for example, I'll, I'll give you a classic example of of one I was looking at the other day. Um, residential development, twelve kilometres from the Brisbane CBD. Uh, there's an opportunity to build. Uh, out the uh, an office space in a, in a new subdivision there, and it was a medical facility. It was zoned uh, for a medical. They had that many applications from um, uh, doctors. Um, they had uh, they had all these uh, anchor tenants uh, contacting the developer to say, look, you know, when is it available? We need the space. We need the space. In many of these fields. And, and again, it comes back to those layers, just to add a few more in commercial, which we can go into, um, there is huge demand. So there is huge demand for Coles and Woolworths, which are your um, major shopping centre um, people here. They're Subway, all those type of outlets, they're, they're all got that real estate model and they're anchored, they're great anchor tenants and um, industrial storage sheds, um, you name it, there's, there's certain huge demand for, for these various types of commercial opportunities. But again, you, you've got to really understand the areas and the markets and that type of thing. Um, in the future, coming in the future, we're certainly going to be offering those, what we believe, that passes our probably 150 point check. Uh, we're going to add a few more different layers so people can understand it. Um, but we would really like to invest, uh, I believe, in commercial and, and certainly the big commercial people that have been involved in here, when you've got the anchor tenants, you've got half the story um, and and that's the type of thing that we're, that we're going to be bringing to the market. We could spend another two hours talking about commercial, uh, but I'm more than happy to sort of sit down and show live examples and, and that type of thing of, of the type of thing you can buy as a non-resident or be involved in syndicates, that, that type of thing, Scott. Yeah, no, look, I think obviously that, you know, that is the best idea when we're, when we're, we're sitting one-to-one and even, you know, possibly looking at for people that are slightly more sophisticated or want to get involved in the development stuff, we can we can run through all the numbers and the projects and, and give guys an idea of track record. 
Um, a good question before we move on to the final question, Richard. Sonia Warren says, uh, have we not missed the bus? If we didn't invest in Australian property some years ago, uh, price increase in RAND dev dev devaluation. I mean, we did have a client that bought in 2010, um, and I'm not going to share his name right now, but he told us, shared with us about uh, two weeks ago, um, Yako and I had a meeting with him, and he actually said his whole family sat back and in 2010 said they were going to wait um, for a year or so and see how it went because they didn't trust the process and wada, wada, wada. And, um, mm. and they didn't do anything. And, and within two years, the prices had gone up too much and the rand had devalued too much and they couldn't get involved anymore. They, they can no longer um, invest. And so, you know, Sonia, it's, it's, a, it's, it's very difficult to, to make that call. Um, none of us have crystal balls better than anyone else, but I am a big believer in, in managing the variables as they stand at the moment. I don't know where we'll be in three months, six months, or, or, or 36 months, other than with the ability to track long-term trends. That's my opinion. Uh, Richard, from your opinion, what do you think in terms of Mr. Bus? Uh, no, look, I, I'd like to add to that from, from a development perspective, having a pretty good gauge on, on what works. Um, some of these developments are selling out for a very good reason. All of that 100-point layer system I talked to you about before, but um, for example, uh, there are developments that meet that criteria, uh, they hit it right on the nose and they are there at this point in time for a number of reasons uh, at the right price, at the right market and they may not come back again. So in my mind, I think you've got to keep an open mind, you've got to do, you, there's a lot of research that's got to be done but I, I, I think when, when the iron's ready to strike, you, you've got to strike because the right developments can come along and they can sell out to Australians um, very quickly. And, and that's what you're seeing a lot of, especially now moving into the Brisbane, still the Melbourne's red hot, um, still moving, in, now moving into the Brisbane market. Those, not necessarily the, the, the price growth, but getting the right property in that afford because it's so hard to create them, um, when they come along, that's when you should really be, you know, seriously considering jumping on board. No, it's a great, uh, you know, it's like anything in life. If it was, was it better to do something, you know, 10, 20, 50 years ago? You know, was it better to buy Google 10 years ago? Of course it was. But you've also got to take uh, mm. where, where the market is and the fundamentals. And that's why I love what you, what you share with people in terms of the research. The last question I've got, and I've, I've actually got a, a survey open at the moment, you know, a lot of people in South Africa, especially if you dealt with home affairs like I did today, um, would, would, you know, just like to have the peace of mind of knowing that uh, possibly they've got an alternative passport, possibly if things would happen, they could choose where they wanted to live. Um, but, but generally, from my experience, nowhere in the world can you buy a property and get a passport and it's a good investment. You know, you could talk to me about Cyprus or Malta or Mauritius or any one of the 16 countries that I wrote about. Um, in chapter 10 of my book, um, and, and I, can, I can actually show you why, why they're not good investments. But I was intrigued by what you taught me and what you showed me with how you've been helping other uh, foreign investors get um, residency possibly. And, and I wanted you to just go into that in a little bit more detail, literally two, three minutes because we, we're running out of time here. But um, just, from, yeah, just from your perspective sure. in terms of what's, what's happening in, in the Australia at the moment from a residency perspective. Guys, you, you're probably well aware how much interest there is in Australia from places like Asia. And um, so what, what, what's happening there is they, they have created uh, various visas and, and one of the ones Scott's talking about is a significant investor visa whereby a person or persons can put in um, a larger sum of money effectively as long as it meets the criteria of creating jobs. Um, and it's stimulating the economy. And one of those, uh, one of the major ones that, that we're finding now coming from wealthy in, uh, Asian investors is they're investing into either a project uh, as, a, as a joint venture with a company, obviously like the IPSs and, and that type of thing, because you're ticking all the boxes. You're creating housing and you're stimulating the economy by creating jobs, you know, town planners, plumbers, painters, carpenters, that, that type of thing, real estate agents and, and creating something. So it's, it's, it's looked upon very favorably and this is why you're seeing these vast numbers of um, visas. There's been a lot of talk about that here because it, uh, what's been happening is people have been doing it the wrong way but um, done the right way. Um, 
then you can get in onto the development level and also meet the criteria um, which property does. That, that ticks all the boxes and um, once, once it's set up properly, it, um, it's something that can be built upon and, um, and managed in very, very easily here. But again, Scott, that one will take a, you know, takes a lot of going into. But just, just to give a very broad overview, uh, we've, we've uh, helped uh, a number of investors uh, with, with companies that with uh, development companies here in Australia that obviously are looking at, at joint ventures and um, the offshore or Asian, for example, uh, investor has invested into a, a various project and that's ticked all the boxes. So a bit of a process to go through, but uh, obviously great advantages. Look, I think, again, if people are interested in sitting down with you um, and, and going through it, if they can just type in meeting um, or, you know, and, and they can meet with you next week. Um, I think there's, um, as I said, there's only six slots available, although I see a number of people have put their names on already. So I will have to figure that one out. And then um, also I'm going on the buyer's trip um, with you, Paul, back over to Australia with uh, yourself. Um, if people want to just type in buyer's trip and, and we can, you know, go and actually see those projects on the ground in terms of in terms of what is actually happening. So, I mean, I can see you've got a slide up there, Richard. I am um, I am conscious of people's time, and and so if there's if there's are there any more slides that you think are relevant, or can I go back to my slides? Oh no, absolutely, go back to yours. I think um, far away, so I don't ramble anymore. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> it's it, it is twenty past forty. So nah, you, you do good. tend it's to go a little bit. Um, it's all good. Yeah. So I'm just going to go through. We've asked a number of these questions in terms of where we're at, and um, I think really the last thing that I would just say is that you know one of the things that I've learned a lot in life, and there's a company that one of the companies that we did due diligence on that were very nice, and you know they live in in uh, in Australia in uh, in Queensland. And they get on an airplane, they fly out here with a suitcase, and they sit in a hotel room, and they sell South African stuff, and they've got very little back office uh, teams. And, you know, we've even even had our own internal issues where, where people, uh, you know, uh, believe that they can, can can offer the service. But one of the things that, that we pride ourselves on is, is focusing on markets. You know, it took us over a year of going to Australia and finding the best people on the ground. And, you know, back in... Many, many years ago, I started saying to Richard, you know, I really think that with your energy and your, your passion, your drive, your knowledge, and, and most importantly, how you've looked after our clients and, and your understanding of development, you know, we should be doing business together. And it was with, uh, you know, it's a great honor uh, back in the middle of this year in July that we finally agreed to, to go forward and, and to, to, to form a, a partnership and, and to get directly involved in business together, both in the IPS side and in the Wealth Migrate side. And, you know, I think just from... From my perspective, it, it's so good to actually have someone on the ground in Australia on a permanent basis. You know, we're not an estate agent trying to peddle something. Uh, we actually have partners on the ground. But but from your side, Richard, you know, why why did you want to be part of this team, you know, um, in terms of what, what we're doing and what the big picture is? Look, I think, um, you know, apart from obviously your wonderful self, Scott, um, I think it's been a pleasure to see people benefit over the years and now we've got that we've got that history of people that I've met uh, many years ago uh, and, I'm, and I'm specifically talking about people from from overseas um, who have we've I've either dealt with while I've been in South Africa um, I've met them out here we've taken them to to what they purchased um, and that they've, they've been over the moon uh, with it and to keep that relationship, to hear the feedback, uh, it's it's a positive thing because what I did learn is people had a, and they do, they do have a very um, great need to make sure they do the right thing with this hard-earned money that that they've um, they've built up, and um, it's it's just been great, a real pleasure to see people benefit from that and actually say thank you, um, which has been really good. So um, I've enjoyed it and and. Um, and I hopefully we we now that we're we're moving forward and some of the opportunities that we're we're about to launch um, are going to be of great benefit to people. Yeah, Again. it's interesting you say that, Richard. You know, some of the or many of the people that you helped back in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, when they were buying at six rand to the dollar, 
um, I'm sure are, are smiling uh, quite a lot at the moment in Absolutely. terms of uh, what's happening. It doesn't even matter what's happened with the property price, um, considering with where, where the rand is and, and, and what's going on. Um, Brent Carney's asked a good question. Does Richard and his team also oversee the leasing, tenant selection, management? A hundred percent, Brent. We don't just help people buy property. We believe that buying property is only 20% of the whole process. Um, we provide a full end-to-end solution, which includes setup, financing, how you're going to structure the property, buying the property, and right through to management and maintenance. Um, it's essential that you've got that entire end-to-end um, procedure. And something we're actually launching, um, hopefully by the end of this year, we'll have it fully out as our private wealth solution, where, we, where you could actually got a private banker that can oversee your properties for you, whether it's in Australia, England, America, South Africa. Um, but hopefully Yuck was online um, and I'll give him a little prod to hopefully we're going to get that up, up, up and running soon. But very much, Brent, um, you've got to have everything in place um, in, ter- in terms of where we're at. Um, just to, just to last two slides and then we can take as many questions as I can. Richard needs to go to sleep. But, um, you know, in terms of where and why, um, there's three major markets we focus on, the US, Australia, the UK, um, if you're talking internationally, and then, and then South Africa. Um, I've written an entire book with Clem Sunter on it. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail tonight, but, uh, but in simple terms, you know, America has a lot of affordability and there's good opportunity at the moment and there's good yields. Um, but the Australian economy is, 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 is far more um, soundly managed. It doesn't have the debt. Um, it's a much smaller economy, but, but it's, it's, it's tied to, to, to Asia uh, and certainly tied to the future. And yes, there's some risks on the commodity side, but again, I wrote about it extensively in, in, uh, in Chapter 8 of, of the book in terms of the Australian market. And I just really think that the three things that are most important for Australia is that it's got a strong, sound economy. It's got, it's got a very um, good population growth. Uh, there's only two ways to get into Australia. You've either got money or skills. And so the country, unfortunately, for us who love rugby or cricket, is only getting stronger and stronger. And that, for me, is, is very good from a long-term perspective. And then the last part from a property perspective is the supply and demand is good. And that's why it's in the low risk. Um, and, and only in terms of the low return is, is merely in terms of the yields and, and the fundamentals. But from a safety perspective, it, it's certainly something that's looked at. And that's why we balance it. And, and Australia and America are so important. When I look at London and, and the UK, um, the London market to me at the moment is very, very overpriced. It's the highest it's ever been. Yields are at an all-time low. And, you know, I own a number of properties in London. I'm not selling them, but, but I just think it's very, very risky at the moment. I don't have a lot of faith in the UK economy. Um, I don't have a lot of faith in the UK population and where it's going over the next 50 years. It's tied to Europe. And personally, I think it's part of the Roman Empire. Um, or following the Roman Empire, and um, and I'm not on my own, you know, whether you speak to Jim Rogers or my number of other people. So strategically for me, um, you know, Australia and, and America make, make a lot more sense, and, and then there, there's multiple other com- companies, uh, countries. So, you know, I can only really speak with my money and my feet, and, you know, at the moment this year um, I've been, well, what, two or three times to, to America. We've been to Asia, and, and I'm going back to Australia in three weeks in terms of you know um you know getting our investments uh, going um properly there again um because we believe the timing's right and, and and most importantly for me it comes back to to the partners on the ground so you know we've got uh, we've got richard as i said he's coming out and uh, we're going to watch the rugby on saturday so he'll be very upset on sunday and, and probably um on monday and tuesday so those of you that see him in joburg he's not going to be at his best because the all blacks would have lost to the springboks um but uh we do have uh, do have meetings in, in Johannesburg on the 6th and 7th, in Durban on the 8th, and in Cape Town on the 9th. You can see Lucinda's number there, um, 082-319-5092. Uh, if you want to just send her a text right now, uh, for those of you who put in meetings uh, and buyers trips, um, we will contact you tomorrow. Lucinda or one of the team will contact you tomorrow, and we can hopefully try and help you out. I know that there were only six meetings available before tonight. Because uh, a number of our clients, well, most of our clients want to meet with Richard. And then lastly, the buyer's trip. I'm coming over from the 22nd of October to the 28th of October. Um, I'm only going to be focusing on Brisbane this time because really we believe that's where the opportunities are, are, are this uh, at the moment. And so I'll be spending time with Richard. If you want to come with us, uh, let us know. Um, if it's too last minute, 
then we can also do mandates. Uh, if you want to type in mandate, we can get back to you. But ostensibly, we your ears and eyes on the ground. You tell us what you're looking for. And when I'm there with Richard, I can take all the pictures, the videos. I can send it back to you. Um, if you don't have the time to come with us, then we can be ears and eyes on the ground like we've done on uh, multiple, multiple occasions in, in England, Australia, and in America. And then again, if you're interested in the buyer's trips for 2015, just write down buyer's trip 2015 and uh, we'll let you know the details. We're just finalizing all the details of those trips uh, for next year. So, you know, as I said to you, if you're interested in meetings, just type in meetings. If you're interested in the buyer's trip uh, this time, then just type in buyer's trip. If you're interested in, in a mandate, just type in mandate. And if you're interested in buyer's trip 2015, just type in buyer's trip 2015. Um, there is a, an email as well that you can email Lucinda if you don't want to, uh, you know, send a text message and she can get back to you tomorrow and send you the details. And I will say to you next week, I'm also going to be doing a webinar um, where I'll just be doing it on my own, where I'll be explaining to you um, why we go on the buyer's trips, what the benefit of the buyer's trips are, how mandates work, how we, how we are, are the guys on the ground and, and can really help you. You know, for those people that are time poor but but don't want to miss out on the opportunity and be asking questions like Sonia was uh, now, you know, miss the boat. You know, Richard, the one thing that I, I laugh when you you bring up the in a good way, it's great to meet clients that, that we helped in 2008, 2009, 2010, et cetera. Um, but, you know, I always wonder in 2020, as in six years from now, you know, we'll be having these similar conversations and people will be saying, you know, I wish I had or, or when we or, or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I, I just mm -hmm. personally, long-term trends are, are there. I love living in South Africa, but certainly it gives me a huge amount of peace and comfort to know that I've got offshore assets and that I'm earning an, an offshore income. So, you know, I think, you know, from my perspective, I'm not sure if there's anything else from, from your perspective, Richard. Um, or if there's any questions from anyone else, I know it is late there, and I'm, you know, I know you want to get to bed, and we did say we'd finish around uh, around eight thirty. But is there anything else from your side, Richard, that you think is important? Oh, look, I think um, <clears throat> just to let everybody know that um, if there are questions, if there's things people want me to look into, I mean that that's what I'll do. I'll look, I'll, I'll certainly extend that um, that uh, service. To, to anybody uh, if they want me to look into something specifically for them, uh, any questions, any time. There's Skype, there's, there's, a, there's various forms of communication now. There's, there, there's no reason not for me to be able to get in contact very, very quickly. Um, so yeah, I'm here to help. If, if, so if you can feel free to, to, to offer that service out to everybody and, and anybody, that's, that's not a problem. Awesome. I hope to see you on the other side. I really, really appreciate that. And again, thanks for being online. 3 a.m. to 4.30 in the morning is uh, <laughs> is not normal. Um, but I think it's it's testament to the passion you have for helping people. And so I really, really appreciate it. To everyone who's been online tonight, it's, it's fantastic. I can see that virtually everyone has stayed right to the end, which, which is fun, you know really, really awesome. And hopefully you've uh, got value out of tonight. And you know, please give us some feedback. You know, If there's other stuff that you're interested in, we can certainly help. Um, we, we always have a challenge because there's so much information we want to share in limited amount of time and it's being able to condense it and, and make sure we're focusing on the important stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we believe in, our, and I repeat myself, but we believe in only two things. You've got to have the right information. You've got to have the right partners. Having been in Australia for over six years, yeah, I think I can categorically say that all the stuff that Richard has helped me and, and our investors invest in, has really come through in the long run, and and, and time has, has, has stood the testament with regards to that. And and really, it starts with the information he provides, and and the partners, not only in himself, but the partners. You know, he's dealt with the best partners on the ground in in Australia, and he can he can certainly help out. So, you know, it really is wonderful knowing that we've got someone uh, who I trust so much on on the ground in Australia. And and so, from all of us, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I think I think that's everything. Unless there's any questions. Um, we do look forward to, to helping you. We do look forward to seeing you in terms of, uh, you know, when Richard's over here or, or on the buyer's trip or possibly even next year. But, but certainly the last thought that I would leave you is that, again, many of you have heard me say it before, but it's the lesson that I learned from my uncle. You know, at the age of 30, he, he chose to just take some of his money and invest it offshore. He loved living in Africa. But at the age of 53, he decided it was time to move uh, from Zimbabwe to, to Brisbane. Um, he, uh, Richard's actually dropped me off at his house. He knows exactly where it is. And, um, you know, at the age of 53, he was able to buy a house for cash. 
He was able to put his kid, you know, through a private school. He was able to 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 retire so that he didn't have to work for an Australian. You know, he could buy his way into into Australia, you know, from a visa perspective. And all that he did, the one defining thing that was different between him and everyone else was that he had a conviction, he took action, and that allowed him the freedom to make any decisions he wanted in the future. And hopefully, if nothing else tonight, we just want to offer you that same freedom so that you can make whatever choice it is you want in the future. And, and certainly for me, um, owning first world assets and earning a first world income is a fantastic positive whether I want to live in Africa for the rest of my life and, and my son and generations to come. Uh, there's no harm in owning first world assets. But the challenge is if I live in a country with a depreciating um, currency and, 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 and possibly economic and political uncertainty, and I don't have a plan B and, and foreign income and foreign assets, um, I certainly find myself very exposed. That's my own personal feelings, but that's why we're so passionate and we do what we do. So I don't think there's any further questions. Richard, I want to thank you for your time. For everyone else that's been online tonight, it's been awesome. And we'll be chatting soon. Pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Bye then.